Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman chats with Joel Valenzuela, who has been living off of crypto and unbanked since 2016. Joel, like Doug, is passionate about the digital cash use case of crypto. The two discuss which cryptos are doing digital cash the best and which services slash tools make cryptos like Monero more usable for day-to-day -day cash purposes. Joel is primarily focused on Dash but had positive things to say about Monero too. Monero Talk starts now. Joel, what's going on, man? Hey, how's it going? Not, not I feel much. like we're... No. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I feel like we're bizarro versions of ourselves. Like, uh, you know, I'm the Monero guy. You're the, you're the Dash guy. Yeah, a little bit. I don't know but, which one's bizarre, though. I don't know. What's that? Yeah. The thing is, it's kind of funny how um, things work with like a small, the small crypto world as it is of people that, I mean, the, the world has gotten so much bigger with a bunch of people going into pump tokens and stuff. But I feel like... Um, a lot of us are here for a very specific purpose and stuff ends up, you know, taking us in little different micro paths, but we're on the same, you know, greater path. And so, so yeah, yeah, there's definitely more that unites us than divides us. Right. That's what I think people mm -hmm. often forget. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, what's going on? I forget. How did we even come across each other? Was it just, uh, through Twitter? I it probably was through Twitter, to be honest. I know you said you were at Porkfest, which I've been yeah. to almost every port. I think I skipped one year since 2014, but I've been oh, wow. since there because it's, you know, I live two hours south of Porkfest, so it's not like it's that hard to get to. So, yeah. And now, have you always lived probably... in New Hampshire? No, I moved in 2013 for the Free State Project, and it was just the basic idea of that, of which I'm not sure how much your listeners know all hundred percent about that, but basically people who love freedom are too few and far between. Let's all go to one spot where we can make magic happen. And so, you know, people moved and magic happened. And as part of this, when I'm on the drive over, I already knew about crypto. Like I, I forgot that I knew until I saw some like early articles. I wrote like beginning of 2013, but it was on the drive over that someone I had lunch with someone in Chicago and they gave me Bitcoin for my part of the pizza and then that was like, from then on, it was just, um, I was, I think uh, last month this is my eight year anniversary, my first purchase of something with Bitcoin at a retail location, like an actual shop around here. You know, it was like eight years, a long time ago. And now it's like, now you see it here and there, but back then that was that. So it just kind of, I went from there. I've sort of been only been trying to use as much crypto as I could since 2013 because of that. And then at the end of 2015, I just decided to not accept any more fiat for like salary or payment or anything anymore. And then later, about six months later, I was like done with my bank account. And then I here I, here I am. So that's kind of the long and the short of it in like a, a condensed version, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I tried getting paid in Bitcoin in the early days, but mm -hmm. I, I mean, my day job definitely wouldn't have paid me. I worked for a municipality, but I was doing some side work and... The guy I was dealing with was pretty cutting edge, but yeah, he wasn't he wasn't willing to do it at the time. He wasn't a crypto guy at the time, which uh, I think he regrets now. That was like, yeah, I guess it was probably twenty fifteen. Yeah, um, yeah, but now the ecosystem has grown. It's grown to where 
you don't really need to have people on board to live on crypto really you can it makes a lot of things easier but there's enough services and things in between where like i remember bitwage started to where you could receive your salary your direct deposit and it just get auto converted to bitcoin no one even needed to care and i think coinbase rolled out a similar feature just in the last month or two where now you can get it right in any your direct deposit like they don't even have to know it's going to crypto it just gets into anything that coinbase supports and so i mean you know i don't do direct deposits i don't do either of those things but for everyone else you know you can kind of kind of do that it's it's pretty crazy yeah 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 so it, that's pretty amazing that you were doing it so early on just completely living mm -hmm. off of crypto did you have to convince a lot of people in the early days then were you like had to convince your favorite restaurant to accept crypto or i mean obviously now it's like we're saying it's a lot different but when you first started yeah pretty much i mean part of the thing which is why i'm here the free state project is a great it has a great community imagine like you know imagine hardcore crypto friends that you know and imagine you got like 5000 of them in like a small in like a 1.5 million population area right yeah no so, i you know, when i was in pork fest i was blown away by that but yeah go ahead yeah and so just imagine like the all of pork fest is still like all within a hour to drive from you it's just they're all still there and right. so it's easy to convince like you don't even have to convince people in the community so it kind of like agorist transactions like uh, there's this farm we get all our meat from that for several years it takes any crypto imaginable and um they're just there you go that's the connection I, there is, and that, then, is that the the guy who was grilling up burgers and steaks at pork fest like they really had the long lines going is that the same, is that, that might have been that might have been another guy because there's a few that was some really really good really good food and he just uh yeah, yeah took only crypto he took monero yeah, he took gas yeah yeah no it was next to the pig roast, roast. Yeah, yeah 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 the pig roast is one too but it must have been mm -hmm. I'm trying to think it was jay noon i don't know remember exactly but yeah it's super cool, i mean dude. it's it's possible it just that I mean, in the beginning, there's like a few services you had to rely on. Like, I think I use Gift a lot, that Bitcoin um, gift card service, which is quite clunky compared to what what's around today. And mm -hmm. then you could use Purse to do stuff off of Amazon. And then there was like a couple of other things you could do. And then the rest was like, you know, oh, I need to order. Like, I need to buy something online sometimes. And then I couldn't. And then I'd just say, hey, can I pay you for that? And you use your credit card or whatever. You know, I'd like work out some stuff with people. And it just got, it's, you know, a, what is it? That was like six years ago almost. It's gotten a lot easier since then for sure. Were you trying to, were you working in crypto field at the time? Were you trying to work on crypto projects? Or this was just um, love of crypto? Was... You just wanted to it was Growing a shift up. to that stuff so i was working in like a political nonprofit, which is kind of my old school world and then mm -hmm. i was doing some part-time thing and then at some point i just you know doing that i started to get really into crypto and like radical liberty not just like you know suit and tie let's go testify in a court here at a you know committee hearing kind of liberty stuff and so I started, I was being pulled in that direction. And then I basically, I basically turned down like a, a good full-time job. And that was, it was like the crossroads. I'm like, you know what? I don't think I'm meant for this. And I mean, which still would have been a great option. Let's be honest. But then I just decided, you know what? I just, I want to do this crypto stuff. I would just love to be working in crypto. I'd love to be paid in crypto. I love to do all this stuff. And so I, then I just, you know, quit my part-time job and then just like, what do I do? Well, <laughs> there was like, not, not the smartest move. And, you know, in retrospect from like what I could recommend other people just cause it worked out, but I was just looking who will pay me in this. And so yeah. for example, I don't know if you ever, I don't, depends on some of the old school people remember the um, Bitcoin Bigfoot flyers. It was like, you know, and so I pay, I was the copywriter for that. So like the guy paid me in Bitcoin for that. And then there's Wait, like, what a were the little, the what Bitcoin were Bigfoot. Yeah, I don't think ever tell us. What was that? Yeah, that was like back in 2014 or whatever. It's like some of the earliest like Bitcoin propaganda you'd see, like you know, like Plan B, 
all that kind of stuff. Whenever the plan B came around, it was like right around that stuff. Okay. So I did some of that, but basically I just like cold email coin telegraph and was just like, Hey, um, do you want, you want a writer? And that within like 15 minutes, they answered me and it was like over Christmas as well, which is a little bit weird. But so I just got, just started writing because I had some connections or I knew some people and then we just started writing articles for coin telegraph and I hadn't done a lot of journalism at that point. I did a lot of like blog type you know, op-ed type writing or academic writing, but I have some journalism in the family. And so just cut my teeth doing that, doing writing for coin telegraph was like the big thing for a while. And then I worked for way back in 2016, the beginning, I did a little work for a library, which, you know, is now largely odyssey is their big flagship product but that was like just doing the blockchain it had launched and they couldn't really they didn't really do a whole lot back then but just did it did some stuff and you know just basically i just decided you know what i will look for work anything that i can do that people will pay me but they got to pay me in bitcoin or i won't do it and figured out how to make it work you know which is it, it, it kind of it's like a responsibility thing where i felt like I was telling too many people about how this stuff was going to change the world. And I didn't like it. Like I was like, Oh, you should use Bitcoin. You should get this stuff. But I wasn't familiar enough with it to that level. So I figured the only way you get familiar is if this is your life. And so right, I just right. did it for kind of like integrity purposes, I guess, like just so I That's could sleep enough. at night saying, yeah, you should buy this stuff, man, or you should use it, you know, and be like, well, that's what I use. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Um, yeah, I kind of just I was just like sitting on the sidelines, mm -hmm. trying to take in as much information as possible. It was kind of my, you know, keeping the day job and then just trying to, you know, acquire as much crypto as I mm -hmm. could. You know, didn't have a lot of extra income at the time and was just absorbing as much. You know, it was mostly Andrea Santanopoulos and you know, mm -hmm. Bitcoin subreddit. So yeah, I never, I was, I was thinking like, maybe it would have been cool if I started a podcast earlier, but I don't think I was ready. I was just like trying to learn yeah. so much, you know, it takes some, it takes time. And then I really, mm -hmm. I started the podcast once I got, you know, I was into Monero and studying it mm -hmm. so much and I like wanted to learn more on a deeper level. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, best way to do that would be to start a podcast and I'd have access to, you know, anybody in the Monero community that I'd want to ask questions to. That was kind of my trajectory with this project. Yeah. And it does really teach you a lot. Cause you know, I do podcasts to get stuff too. And there's something about when you have to, it's like you have to explain it to someone else and right. then that you have to learn it. And some of it just means you talk to an expert, but a lot of it is like, you have to know enough to ask smart questions and you know, that it does really aid in your understanding to kind of go down that path. But I will say nothing aids in your understanding quite like using it and having it break on you and be like, oh, why doesn't it work? And then having to go through all that. That's that's where you get the real understanding. Definitely, definitely. So how, what have you learned? Um, where or what do you think about where we are versus where we were, right? So you said it was very difficult in the early days. Obviously, mm -hmm. it wasn't highly adopted. Where do you think we currently are on on that trajectory of eventually being fully adopted? Like, how do you feel about it now? Is it pretty usable? Is it just as usable as as a credit card at this point? Like, what's your what's your take? Um, yeah. So I remember, like back in the day, I couldn't spend it anywhere, and I like I was you know using mostly Bitcoin. I couldn't spend it directly almost anywhere, and then I was using Gift, which is like a gift card service. And for a while, they were accepting zero confirmations. So I could like buy a gift card semi in real time, not like at a register, but I could kind of go to the mall, see what I wanted, figure out how much it was going to be. And you can buy in like blocks, like 25, 50, whatever. And I could kind of figure that out. And that was rough. And then I never, I didn't use any KYC services. So in the beginning, they had some crypto debit cards or, you know, I guess Bitcoin only. There was a, there was a, crypto generic one after that that it took more but like i used a wirex card back when they had like a twenty five hundred dollar lifetime limit with no kyc and then after that you had to get rid of it <laughs> so you know i did like that i did a couple of those and then that the regulatory loophole there closed and that was gone 
And the big problem was Bitcoin's fees. In they, when I bailed on Bitcoin because stuff wasn't working for me anymore, was you know about fifty cent fees to a dollar fees is like, and but the problem is the transaction times would be high, and so like, gifts started requiring confirmation. Then I'd be waiting around for like an hour waiting for something to go through so I could buy my lunch. I literally had to skip lunch a few days because my woman money would didn't work, you know? Uh-huh. And so that just, I just couldn't keep doing it. And so that's when I literally went down the top, the list and just said like, well, what else can I use? A bunch of local people did that. And then they're just like, well, there's Ethereum." when, you know, thank God we, we dodged that bullet. Right. <laughs> and then like Dash was the only other one I could use. And so I just started using it. And, you know, in the beginning, that was rocky because it's, you know, as lesser on the totem pole, you just don't have the same uh, like options available. But now I feel like it's almost eclipsed Bitcoin in like usability as far as like the services for spending where, I, where I'm at because paths diverge, right? Like Ethereum, no one's trying to use that as money anymore unless... It's Shiba Inu at AMC theaters. What a joke, right? <laughs> Unless it's something like that. But uh, for example, what I used to have to do with like buy a gift card ahead of times with these little increments and stuff like that, I can go today with a app called Dash Direct up to a register and just they tell me the amount and I enter the exact amount, hit a button, turn it around, they scan a barcode and I paid. And like no KYC, it can usually save like five percent or something like that, and like the and the process may requires a little more work and activity than maybe like tap and pay with like a card or something. I mean, I wouldn't know because I don't I haven't used that in a long time, but it's still smooth enough that you don't hold up the line behind you, and for precise amounts and you actually save money and it like makes sense. It's like you can actually use it like real money. Like digital cash, you know, not like who who you built that. See. Who built that? Is that did that come from the Dash community, like a fund, or was that just built by an outside, like uh, an entrepreneur that just came in? And so it's a little bit of a um, a little bit of a complicated story. But there's this company, feeding space company called Crepe, that basically had this thing for the fiat world where they would sell you gift codes in the exact amounts for whatever you're buying and you'd put your credit card in and so you would do that and so you'd save a little bit and then you get your rewards points on your cards it's kind of like a couponer thing and the Mm. reason they were able to be profitable i believe is out of like geolocation like you know like driving foot foot traffic to retailers and then now that then um some people reached out to them were like hey you should do some crypto thing and in 2017, I believe the CEO was, you know, he was very aware of crypto, but just didn't think it would work for payments because of the whole confirmations thing. And then, you know, they heard, oh, there's this instant send feature in Dash, but it's like, nah, that's like an opt in, only certain wallets. And like, it wasn't until later when it became every transaction is instantly settled that they looked back into it. And then an entity that's under the decentralized autonomous organization of Dash gave them some investment and then they started to build this like specific just for dash app even though they're using they they still have their like fiat commercial product and you know they might even build more apps for more cryptos who knows but that's kind of like how that got in there and yeah it just ended up being a deal Mm -hmm. and the payment processor world in crypto is really underdeveloped so someone from the dash community had to step in and create a an app that would work for like the processing the payments in the app and the fiat settlement whenever they want a fiat settlement for example so that's kind of the long story of like yeah it it was this company but there was a few different actors in the dash world that also helped out yeah any any person in monero land that's listening that's looking for a project Mm -hmm. uh Mimic that. I mean, I think it's great. I think it's great. I was taking a look. I mean, we have we have coin cards, um, mm-hmm. but this is basically a more instant version. It's coin card, an instant version of coin cards, I guess, essentially is what it is, yeah. right? So, on the spot. So I love that. Are they thinking of adding other cryptos or it's purely Dash? Well, the obviously the Dash Direct app is going to be uh, purely Dash. Um, I don't know what their plans are for other things. I mean, it's a... I'm sure you could hit up the crepe company, see what they want to do, but it's, it's kind of like a nexus of a few key 
things at the same time. And I'm pretty sure like the thing, and this is something that's kind of a, a, it's kind of funny how technology can sometimes be really subjective because like confirmations, obviously with Bitcoin, BTC today, since replaced by fee, you can't really trust a, an unconfirmed transaction. Not really. And then, but then Bitcoin Cash, for example, which doesn't have that, people say zero conf is as good as final. But then no services or no major services like exchanges or anything except unconfirmed transactions. But then you, so you have something like Dash that is an explicit thing. And so basically there would have to be like, uh, for a company to be, you know, I guess profitable or something doing this, they'd have to figure out like, do they wait for one confirmation? Like a two, uh, Monero's like two minute blocks, is it? Or is it two and a half? Yeah, two minute blocks, but same argument, you know, if some say it's yeah. instant, right? So like the transaction shows up mm -hmm. instantly. Um, so they might have to do like a threshold for like a certain amount. They trust it instantly. Yeah. Like, like XM bucks XMR dot T O was a service mm -hmm. for swapping instantly between Monero and, and Bitcoin. So if you had Monero, you can mm -hmm. instantly buy something with Bitcoin. And I think, yeah. uh, when they ran that, sir, it's closed down, but when they ran that, they were going off of zero, zero confirmations, I believe for certain thresholds, mm -hmm. so it's certainly doable in Monero. Yeah, and it's the same kind of a thing. Um, it just, it's kind of like the 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 use case has to all kind of come together. The thing that I, th I kind of found out is it's pretty much me and like five other guys who are using crypto on a regular basis. <laughs> like I'm being, I'm being a little silly to like exaggerate, but like it's so rare. And what I learned with like the free market, of course, is where there's a demand, you know, there will be a supply to meet it. And the crypto payment solutions are just awful. Like as far as like point of sale things, none of them work. They all suck. The online payment gateways are okay. But as far as what do you do in person, mm -hmm. there's one that I use a lot called AnyPay. And AnyPay is the only good solution. But it, even then it's just like, it, it only supports like three or four coins. And it's, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't have any fiat conversion in it. It's not... I don't aggressively market it or something like these kinds of things. What we don't realize is the milliseconds of bad user experience, like those little things, like the tipping They're point of like, online. Use this, yeah. yes or no is just, it's so narrow. And so for example, bit refill is a great service, right? Company that uses, it's very similar to the dash direct app in a lot of ways in that you can buy gift cards with crypto. They show up like right away. You can buy, you know, in exact amounts. You can, if you sign up for an account, you can use it without an account or anything. But if you have an account, you can get rewards on it and stuff. But just, it's a little, I mean, it's got a good user experience to where I was using this before Dash Direct came out, right? But just those little bits of like, it's a little bit more difficult to use or, just make it less likely to be used. And I mean, I don't know. I would honestly though, if, if you could bully, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you talk to Sergey who runs the thing. If you can bully them into like, adding Monero to their list of cryptos and stuff, I think that that's probably going to do a lot. Like that's probably like the easiest, best way of like reaching a bunch of people. Cause they basically built in a, a good user experience right there. That's any pay. No, that one is bit refill. Sorry, I'm jumping around oh, with a million oh, different yeah, services. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No bit refill right now. So, but how how would you say bit refill is different than coin cards? Though, isn't that? Just... Um, Card. it's all in the experience. Bit refill has a global network of basically have the best selection out there, and they have some. I don't know what coin cards has for rewards and stuff for like you know bonus points on things or you know discounts rather but bit refill has some depending on the store you can get get a few percent off but just to use your experience and it's one of those things where when you when you just sit like calculate how long does it take your eye to hit here to press the button to do the thing to get exactly to your final product which is the payment code or you know the, the gift code with the barcode or whatever you're, you're doing that thing is just Every 
system I've used, every gift card system that I've used in the past, I've used like, I'm sure, like at least six or eight different services in the past. They all just don't work out for the average person. And BitRefill is really close. Like BitRefill does pretty well. And of course, Dash Direct works really well for like the average Dash person. Direct is even more instant, right? Is, is, uh, it's Yeah. Is that very... it's, yeah. So for example, when you go, it opens your, when it goes to open your wallet mm -hmm. to pay with Dash for the Dash transaction, and then it turns in the gift code, that's all in the wallet. Like it doesn't open up a completely separate app. It opens it right, up inside right. the wallet and then goes right back there. Whereas Bit you, Refill, yeah, it's a little more. But you were saying even Dash Direct wasn't good for in person. You use all AnyPay oh. instead. Well, no, it is good for in person. AnyPay is a point of sale app for a merchant to have. Oh, just from the merchant standpoint. Gotcha. Yes, it's how a merchant can take it, and that is really like that's for merchants who actually want to take crypto, which is. You know, Dash Direct is for those who don't want to take crypto, right? You can like go to Chipotle or wherever else you want to go. So um, from from the merchant's perspective, for something like Dash Pay, what has your experience been with regards to like how is it? How do you think they're experiencing it? Like you as a customer, it's working for you. Is it is it okay on on their end? Is it like slowing things down? Are they getting confused by it, or they don't even notice what's going on? So on Dash Direct, because it's with like major retailers, right? Um, they just know it as a gift code or gift card. And right. depending on the retailer, sometimes it's faster than using a card. Um, sometimes they're like, oh, I forgot the gift card option. Let me call the manager. And that's, you know, that happens once in a while, but it's usually pretty smooth. The best part is where you have like a, and I haven't done this personally, but I know I have some friends who've done it and filmed it and stuff like gone to like an Applebee's or one of those chains that has like the, the station on the table is where you can just do it yourself. You just beep, 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 scan it, and, and it's through. But uh, as far as any pay is concerned, once you figure out how to get a business to actually take crypto and you know actually like hold it, the app works. Unfortunately, it's not in anything like Square or Clover or any main point of sale system, so they have to like switch apps real quick. But the transaction speed is extremely fast. Like You just scan the QR code. It's one QR code for all the coins like you just it just does it automatically you hit pay and be like when your thumb pad leaves the phone it it's already paid and it's done and that works really well some businesses just you know if they don't get enough volume then they might have to tell an employee oh yeah you just go do this and then do this for the bitcoin or whatever awesome awesome yeah, like I said, anybody that's listening in the in the Monero community that's looking for a project, you know, I do think you guys uh, nailed it with the, with the Dash. What is it called? Mm -hmm. Dash Direct. Da yes. Yeah, no, I think I think that's great from what I saw of it. Uh, the coin cards is is really good for my use. You know, I've been using. Mm -hmm. I you know I don't completely live off of crypto, um, but mm -hmm. to a pretty large degree at this point, been using the coin cards has really helped because I could go on to Amazon and this mm -hmm. you can you know do most of your shopping and grocery shopping there so that covers a big big part of you know my life um but yes yeah, certainly would love to see more on ramps for Monero with regards to mm -hmm. making daily payments we um we started a little coffee company well mm -hmm. coffee's the first product have you seen did I tell you about the gratuitous uh, we, we no, I think I might have seen it mentioned, but I don't don't know specifically what it's about. So, so just real quick, yeah. So gratuitous is just um, we sell coffee online. You can buy the coffee. Mm -hmm. It comes from Guatemala, uh, from Antigua, Guatemala. We went down there. We taught the farmers about Monero and gave them their own wallets. So you could drink the coffee, and then you could send a tip in Monero, and it goes to mm. the farmers that we hooked up with their own uh, private keys. So in addition to that, we've been selling selling coffees online, fine, but we've also been selling it in, in person. So it's been interesting, right? Because we're trying to also yeah. get people to pay with Monero. And like you said, you really it takes on a different, it becomes a different animal when you're trying to use it on a daily basis and like in, in real world. Um, you, you learn a lot yeah. and you realize like there's a lot that needs to happen to get to the point where it's as easy as a credit card. But Dash, yeah. is, Dash is definitely doing well in that respect. So, yeah, and that's the one thing yeah. I realized is as far as infrastructure is concerned, uh, when it's 
seasoned crypto peer-to-peer -peer people, it's so much easier to deal in that world. Uh, so for example, there's a brewery, the one where I uh, hold that, I held this, you know, event called Dash Fest a few months ago, and they currently, I mean, unless they switch it up, use the edge wallet, just like a, just the edge wallet for a point of sale system. So you could pay for your beer and Monero there. And so mm -hmm. awesome. that would like when you have, but that's because that's like a friend of the free state project and you know, when you have like a crypto person like that, the same place I buy my meat and stuff from, I'm pretty sure I've seen people use Monero there. There's a good Monero community around here too. In like the peer to peer, where it's just like, oh yeah, I'll take it, zip. It's just the infrastructure is always the, like, that's just the annoying part is like the bi the bigger infrastructure. But like, as far as a peer to peer electronic cash system, like, you know, why we're all should be here. The tools are all really kind of there for, you know, in person farmers market level type stuff to just you know and then all you need after that is just a group of people who want to spend it and then you can start talking to small businesses and just go from there yeah i was shocked to see at pork fest that first of all everybody accepted crypto like i knew i knew like there was gonna be a lot of it mm -hmm. but it was like across the board um and then what i anecdotally felt like were the most popular ones were dash mm -hmm. Uh, Bitcoin Cash and Monero, or the, well, I mean, obviously Monero was my experience. So everybody, anybody I went to took it. Um, and then in me talking to them, they would be like, yeah, definitely into Monero. And then like mm -hmm. Bitcoin itself um, wasn't in my, I didn't really see that as being one of the major things used for, for payments there. Uh, yeah. Dash, uh, Bcash and Monero was, was what I anecdotally observed. And that is absolutely true. Uh, in a lot of the more point of sale environments, it's mostly the first two, but just because the AnyPay app only supports those, does not support Monero. But when you get to that peer to peer environment, it's really just those three. And um, it's, as you, I'm sure you encountered some people who you don't have any Monero really, but they'll take it because it's like, oh yeah, I know that one is a good crypto. And it, it does kind of underscore, because like in 2014, when I went to Porkfest my first time, I loaded up my phone with Bitcoin and I brought no fiat at all. Like literally did not have any fiat and I lasted the whole week without a problem. There was one vendor that I that didn't take crypto, but they took silver. So I bought silver with Bitcoin over there and then gave them all silver pieces and it worked out. But like Bitcoin, that's Bitcoin's heritage, but it just moved beyond that. It just moved to, I mean, just moved to, you know, the store value. It, it kind of, I feel like it was like a settle. Like, well, we're still, you know, relatively decentralized. We still are inflation resistant or still, you know, transparent and like anyone can participate. We're still all these things. Like the biggest thing that we're being robbed from with inflation is, you know, our wealth. So if we just get away from that, that's enough of a win for us. And I mean, I respect some of that, but I kind of want more, <laughs> you know, I want everything. I want all my freedom. Yeah. I mean, I on a technological level, I feel like, mm -hmm. uh, you need to be, you need to be more than that for mm -hmm. it to work. Cause at really at the end of the day, what are you at that point? You're just, uh, you're based on speculation, right? So if, if it's just yeah. trying to be digital gold, I think it starts to fall apart as an idea. It doesn't have any base utility. Um, it's just, you know, at that point you might as well make Shiba coin, the, the digital gold or, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it kind of loses its, its base utility. Um, when you design your protocol to be the best form of a speculative asset, right? Like, I don't know that, that it, yeah. it falls apart in my mind. So that's why I like yourself, I think are, you know, more into the digital cash side of it. I think that's, that was the breakthrough and that's the base utility because no matter what the price is or what people think it is during that time, whether they think it's digital gold and it's high or they think it's worth, it still works as a network for the purposes of transacting value. Right. And I think that yeah. was like the breakthrough. And that's a one thing I've been, because being like a crypto veteran doesn't mean you actually know anything. It just means, you know, some up until this point, but it just keeps evolving at such a huge pace that one thing I've realized too is being like inflation resistant and like a store of value isn't good enough because people want rewards on that. 
And some of that, like they want staking rewards. They want to be able to stake their coins. And some of that is like, you know, people just greedy. They want Shiba coin. They want just want mad gains. But some of it is also there's so much there's value to capital that anyone has. And when you put people want to be able to easily put their capital to use making more money, which is the entire you know, idea of a savings account to begin with, although the government just made sure that's useless to us. But like people want to be able to put allocate the, you know, the their money that's sitting there doing nothing and getting something return. Like people want to be able to that's a big thing that I am hugely excited about is Thorchain is going to be adding uh, Dash and Monero very soon, I guess. I don't know how very soon is very soon, but I know they're working on both a lot. And the thing with like Thorchain is not only can you swap between everything like an exchange without centralized third parties, which is huge in a world of delistings, right? But you can also provide liquidity in your native asset and then just get rewards from it. Like imagine like someone has like 25 Monero and they just like, all right, well, I'm, I'm not spending it today. I'm going to put it on Thorchain. Use that as liquidity when people are swapping in and out of other things. Like maybe they get paid in something else but then they want to turn it to more private and then they swap it for Monero or whatever every time that you earn part of that transaction and then all of a sudden you just got like making like 15 percent apy on your like on your Monero like just generally like people are, are going to start demanding those kinds of things because they should have had that on fiat except the government made them jump through so many hoops and become accredited investors and all this other stuff just to be able to make a little return so that's gonna that's another like minimum oh, yeah, that's requirement you know yeah yeah and i definitely see monero adopting that in a very large way because out of necessity right like you said with delisting yeah, uh, monero is a prime target for that so it's mm -hmm. sooner than any other coin it's probably going to try to jump to to really uh, utilize that uh, obviously we're working on atomic swaps and stuff but they don't seem like they're going to be as as usable or user friendly as 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 Thor chain or not as it won't get there as fast. So I do think there's going to yeah. be a pretty large adoption there. Yeah, for sure. So what do you what do you think about Monero, man? This is this is Monero talk after all. Obviously, yeah. what we'll talk we could talk compare it to Dash, but uh, what's what's mm. your take on Monero? Well, I have used it in the past. So I've gotten paid in it and. I think I bought some stuff with it, but basically I would like, I would give, I definitely put a high opinion. And the reason for that is this, uh, the entire reason I got into crypto was because at first it was um, inflation resistant stuff. And before I got into Bitcoin, I was trying to get one of those like P Peter Schiff's like gold back debit cards and stuff. And like, I was trying to do that. I mean, it was like, Obviously, that was never going to work. But and after that, the entire reason I first got into like I got in one things I really loved about Bitcoin was, you know, the pseudonymity, the fact that anyone could be an address and you just don't know. And when I was young in this, it was, you know, naively thinking it was like anonymous. But then at some point, like when they added HD wallets and you got like a new address, every time like i didn't understand i was mad i was like i just want my one before that i used to use i just want to keep using that one i didn't get how like horrendous <laughs> that is because you know privacy and stuff and at, at that 2014 pork fest um i remember this one guy was selling bacon pancakes for he was like i think it was like bitcoin litecoin dogecoin and dark coin back when dash was called dark coin i was like oh what's this dark coin stuff i never heard about that and so the kind of like privacy angle is something that really got me into crypto and specifically into Dash, although, you know, things have morphed into quite a bit beyond that. But I do believe privacy is a human right. And I believe that it's sad. It's kind of sad that there's a little bit of a lot of people are, I think that people should be fighting over or they should be debating over what's the best way to achieve that goal. But I just, I think that a lot of people get too bogged down in the perfect solutions to remember that there's some people that just need to be pushed into like one, one of the many, like I have some friends that are very big Zcash advocates. And unfortunately the Zcash community hasn't done a great job in my view of 
getting out there and being actually usable as cash places like almost nothing no infrastructure takes it which is a little little sad but i really i mean i think i wrote an article a few years ago saying about how uh monero had a genius strategy by making its primary functions primary special feature a a kind of a base requirement of using it i didn't think that was smart in the beginning because i was like well if you have the, the way the structure is it's just like it's harder to integrate and i remember the jack's wallet like had problems and abandoned that and i was like ah that's not not smart but then over time i was like you know what every single blockchain people just like so many people bought and use zcash never uses shielded transactions and they just thought they were being private it's like no that's not how this works you're using like special bitcoin but it's just the same way and so i really think the idea of the always on thing which of course is not you know it's not like anything is a, is a 100 each way but i think that that is a great way to get everyone to you know experience the special features without having to make them care about it and knowing how like dumb people are or just uneducated about using it's already so hard to use crypto why make it harder to turn their privacy stuff on you know so i think that that especially with how lazy wallets have been is uh has been a huge thing like i could send from like a edge to coinomi or whatever and not worry too much about did i mix the right way you know did i mix did i make sure i send in fewer than 10 inputs at a time did i make sure i didn't reuse like you don't have to worry about that you just send it and it, and it works like that so that's something that I think is pretty cool. Yeah, but the fungibility aspect, do you think mm -hmm. that's necessary? So, I mean, I, I obviously do. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, yeah. privacy by default is amazing for all the reasons you, you talked about. But I think in addition mm -hmm. to that, I think it's essential for, for cash mm -hmm. to have the features of cash. So it should be fungible. And if it's not private by default, it loses that uh, fungibility. What's your take on that? Yeah. So... Here's my take on that. Um, a lot of times we get into um, like specific. So the thing about um, like tokens, like cryptocurrencies are fungible tokens and NFTs are non-fungible tokens. And there's, you know, good reason to have both. And yes, having, you know, fungibility is a great benefit for, you know, a cash like system right um the thing is the biggest thing is whenever i try to distill things down i always think of what's the purpose what is the tool how does the tool get help me get there kind of thing and so the big thing is for example i think that i mean privacy is a huge thing bigger than privacy is permissionlessness I think because, you know, like, like, yeah, I guess you could use mobile coin, right? <laughs> Otherwise, but um, the thing is, it's like, what, why do we need, why do we care about inflation? Because literally you're using, losing money every year. Like that's, that's pretty easy. And why do you care about decentralization? Well, you don't actually need decentralization until you need it, right? You like, who cares how many people run the majority of the nodes or the hash power, or whatever. No one cares until you care. And the reason, you know, for that is if there's too many, if one party controls too much, they can, what can they do? They can inflate your, they can change the rules, inflate your money. Oh, you don't have control anymore. Or, or sense your transactions. Yeah. Then, or they could block your transactions. That sucks. And so then the thing about when you get to the whole privacy issue is what are you trying to obscure and why? And what's the best tool for the job? And so it's, so for example, if I see, let's just take the Bitcoin example, because you know, the, the, I guess the historical parts of it or whatever, uh, like Satoshi's coins are one of the biggest examples of weaknesses in fungibility of Bitcoin, right? Of, because everyone knows where they are. A, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, but if it's Satoshi's Bitcoin, don't you think a lot of people would pay more for some of Satoshi's Bitcoin than for a regular Bitcoin? Probably. Sure. They prob 
they probably or would. or by certain measures maybe his mm -hmm. worth like his is almost worth less right because they're locked up in a wallet where if he moves it he uh right the entire threatens the entire network so he's, he's like sitting on this gold mine that he can't can't touch yeah so it, same it's the a, same point is it's not fungible yeah. Right? yeah it's either way it goes it could either be worth more or it could be either worth less and the thing is let's just say you know for for argument's sake someone uses some mixer some like I'm trying I'm trying to see where the best Bitcoin ones are, like Samurai Wallet or something. If someone manages to use that in such a way, including, I believe Samurai Wallet was adding some kind of a Monero swap service. So you could swap your Bitcoin and Monero and then back or whatever to cleanse them or some atomic some swap. Your, yeah. yeah, something like that. And so if someone manages to use that and then your funds are the same as just some other one because no one knows where they came from they're just yours then you've achieved personal fungibility right and or personal privacy and for the purposes of someone tracing where did your money come from or seeing where it's going that is achieved now i do agree on the other hand that even if you that the less i guess global network fungibility there is the harder it is to then achieve that personal fungibility that's for damn sure yeah um, and i'd argue it's not necessarily yeah. really achieved though even because mm -hmm. you're on the side of receiving the bitcoin uh mm -hmm. now you have bitcoin that um may be marked as going through that process right uh especially for for yeah. mixing for the atomic swap with monero uh it's getting mm -hmm. to the point where it's going to be pretty hard to identify that that took place Currently, yeah. you can, I, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. But my point is, it, it's not necessarily, mm -hmm. especially with mixing. With the eventually yeah. with the narrow atomic swap, it may not be visible mm -hmm. to even know that it went through that process. But with most mm -hmm. Bitcoin things, when you try to clean them, even though they're technically clean, they're marked as going through a process of being cleaned, and which may yeah. present a problem when you know in certain jurisdictions or whatever you're trying to do with it. Yeah, which is. To a certain extent, why I also believe, you know, maybe a side note, I guess, is I believe in normalizing basic things like that. Like I would call a, some kind of coin join type thing, a basic privacy type thing where you don't want your, your, your barista to know how much you have in your wallet to club you over the head, but it's not like you're dodging the CIA or anything. And I think I believe in normalizing that, not just for the people who want radical privacy, but like just for literally everyone. Because your bank, when you swipe your bank card, you know, your bank knows how much money you spent or where it went. You know, the merchant does not know. The bank knows, the government knows, but that's it for the most part. And when you use crypto in a direct way, like you take Dogecoin, let's just say, from Coinbase, and then you spend it at AMC theaters, like AMC can tell, like, they know way more than if you used a card in some cases, right? Even though it's not tied to your name, if there's some basic forensics, they do. And so I think that um, we're going to enter a world where, uh, and honestly, I believe that NFTs are going to be what gets us here, but I think, which is a kind of funny thing, but where average people are never going to use crypto unless they have some basic privacy, even if it's not perfect. It's so I like, I don't know if it's going to be a coin join type thing for Bitcoin or whatever, but there will be something that everyone, some basic thing that that governments won't, or at least, you know, in non-despotic countries, governments won't be outlawing just because if this becomes a, a used thing, just because otherwise no one will use it, you know? Yeah, do you think that's good news for something like Monero, which we see getting currently getting delisted and treated poorly um, by regulators? Um, I don't know for sure. So it, it really depends. Um, I think that if people, so what Zcash did is educated, proactively educated regulators on how this is useful and like how this is used and how it's not used. Right. And shielded versus non-shielded. And here's how you can verify some basic things. And that seems to have gotten them through the door of a lot of things. I mean, if you're on Gemini, 
like, you know, one of the most regulated exchanges out there. It's like, that seems to have worked for that. And I guess what would have to happen is there would have to be a concentrated campaign to educate regulators on ways that they can be satisfied with the way Monero is being used, which is also kind of ant antithetical to Monero in some ways, maybe, I don't know, depends on how people want to use it. But like, as long as people can say like, okay, we have to have your view keys for this and we have to see this for this and then we'll be okay. Otherwise you can just use it as you want. As long as there's some like normalized process for the people, you know, they're like that. I, I think it can end up being a good thing in, in the end where this is the one that's just like more private, but everyone can still use it. I think that's kind of what it, what it hinges on. But, um, I honestly don't know how, like, it's it's always hard. I I think it's hard to predict government, really, other than they're always going to act slowly in their own self-interest against everyone else's self-interest. But, I mean, the thing is, I, there's some much bigger things out there. Like, the NFT craze is crazy because, first off, all these Ethereum-based chains they don't even have multiple addresses, really. You got one static address, so everyone can see how much money you have, like super easy, like the old days of Bitcoin. And so if someone has like an NFT, they sell a bunch of NFTs that are all tied to this one address. People can say exactly how much money they made, not just that, but how many NFTs are in their wallet because you want to show off your NFTs and you have all this value in your one static address. I, I mean, I guess no one knows what it is enough, but someone's going to get hit over the head. like. Someone's gonna so these 14 year old kids who made like hundreds of thousands of dollars in NFTs is going to get hit over the head or something as tragic as that is. Then people are gonna wake up, oh, we need some kind of privacy. And then wherever that goes is where the market goes. And I think the government, the government paradigm of well, we have to be able to see all money traveling everywhere is not going to be a long-term paradigm. It's just unsustainable. It was not sustainable in the cash world. And, you know, it's not sustainable in the crypto world. It's only sustainable in this middle ground that we're in still now, where like the bank gets to say, oh, we have all your records, your transactions. But like in the future, where anyone can create a token so easily, anyone can create a chain, anyone can mix something, anyone can do it. There's so many like, Firo's off doing their Atlantis stuff and all that stuff. Like every, there's just so much stuff out there. You can't stop it. So I think at some point regulators, cause let's not be unrealistic. I think regulators will always kind of be with us or at least for the next hundred years, who knows? Uh, they'll have to settle on what are they going to like, what are they going to settle for as far as what information do they need from people? But Tracing every single transaction, I don't think is going to be on the books in the long term. So to roundabout answer yeah. the question, I think it would look good for something like Monero in the long term. I just, I just don't know about the next five to 10 years until we get to that point, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think I pretty much agree. I do think, you know, at the end of the day, governments, regulators, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're influenced by corporations, right? That's, that's what's yeah. really happening. So even with like Zcash, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of, there's some, some people that own a lot of Zcash and I bet you they're all, you know, mm -hmm. also happen to be the people behind Gemini, right? I mean, like you could put the pieces together, yeah, right? So probably. This, this, yeah, that's definitely uh, Barry Silbert, you know, big Zcasher. And then he has his hands in a lot of these mm -hmm. exchanges. Um, and then uh, people have been putting the pieces together too with a lot of the recent delistings with Monero. And yes, is it regulators? But who is telling the regulators to to move in this direction? And it's chain analytics companies is uh, you know kind of uh, mm -hmm. what, what people are chalking it up to, which makes a lot of sense, right? So their bread and butter is tracing transactions. Um, if we allow Monero to be on exchanges and they can no longer trace it, it's you know their business model starts to fall apart. So the regulators are going to be here for a long time because corporations mm -hmm. like regulations, those that have already succeeded. I mean, we saw it here in yeah. New York with the bit license, right? Uh, yeah. They basically made it so you had to be the Goldman Sachs of, of crypto or you know the first mm -hmm. people in the door, and then they make it very difficult for anybody else to get the license. Um, so yeah. unfortunately, I think 
regulation is going to exist for 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 quite some time. What do you think? Now, what's in, yes. What's interesting to tell is how they're going to react to DeFi because they're already starting to freak out about DeFi a little bit and in the ways they didn't freak out about crypto because they realized, oh, wow, no one is going to use our financial system now. <laughs> you know, Like no one. Why would you do that if you can just do DeFi and make so much money to get instant loans off of whatever and any other stuff that I don't yet do or whatever. But it's just like with Thorchain has been like the big thing of, hey, now because of that, you don't need an exchange to swap your delisted asset, i.e. Monero, for something else or to earn interest on or, you know, it's like like loaning it out in Coinbase or something or Binance or whatever. You can basically do the same thing and no one stops you from that. Are they just going to like decide oh well as long as we control fiat on ramps we're happy or are they going to start moving heavy against DeFi? and if they do hit, move heavy against DeFi, what's that going to look like like are people just going to open torchain nodes in different spots in the world where they can't where no one's coming after them are they is are they going to ban all use where it's just like it's kind of like file sharing if they catch you using it you're going to sternly word a letter or something like that or they'll come after you and you have to be super good about like your your you know opsec or whatever to to use it like is it going to be go that way or are they going to just say look if you use DeFi, you make mad gains you owe us a bunch of money and we'll just arrest enough people who don't pay to where everyone still uses DeFi and just kind of cuts a check to the government too like i don't know which way it's going to go it's too early to tell but i think it's going to go the second way i honestly think crypto is just too all of it is too big now, too big to fail in a certain way. And it's it's too big to kill. And so they'll settle for whatever piece they'll set they'll settle for getting a piece of the pie, you know? Right, which is which is why I always arrive at Monero, right? Because it makes it really mm -hmm. difficult for them to get a piece of that pie. Uh Bitcoin, yeah. I think it's very easy to get a piece of the Bitcoin pie. I think it's been uh co-opted in a lot of ways i mean it's i mean it's a perfectly traceable ledger you know they, there's been you know the rumors of the unrealized capital gains i mean bitcoin is the is the perfect uh platform for that right so it's like you can literally look at the addresses and see what the unrealized uh capital gains are and uh find people accordingly um yeah, with but i think Monero, that's, getting... that's go ahead yeah so well, i think that people are sleeping on in the whole privacy thing is the off chain part of privacy where it's not like i think that it's like for example honey pots and things or someone sees oh you bought this much let's just say you can get monero from an exchange you bought this much of monero and then like where did it go from there and oh you're using it at this or a lot of it goes into say coin cards or something and like, Oh, someone's using coin. like they, they try to connect the dots and then just try to like honeypot you that way and bust enough people that some other people will be scared or who even knows what's coming up in the future as far as like facial recognition technology and like the surveillance state beyond that, where people who don't have good, you know, they don't have good security. If there's someone they suspect on just like buying a whole bunch of stuff and then, transacting in a very habitual peer-to-peer -peer way where there's access to a camera and they can do facial ID, just like connect the dots that the blockchain can't tell them. And that's going to be the thing that I think people need to, to worry about a lot more. Uh, my friend, Naomi Brockwell has a, a great video out on how to like get a completely de-googled phone, which mm -hmm. is a great start to this whole thing. But like that kind of stuff, I think, and obviously it's a cat and mouse game, like forever. Like, do you believe how few people got like busted for crazy things with Bitcoin before like HD wallets even? Cause like that was good enough because the government had no idea how to deal with that. And then they figure that out because you know, anyone could when they pay attention and then, Oh, and then the HD wallets and different addresses. Now they're like, okay, well we got to like actually get like a chain chain analysis company to like check that stuff out. And then it's like, well, if they mix it, you can't find that. And they start to like pick apart some of that stuff. And it's just going to be a constant evolving game. And so, yeah, it's yeah, like the more you lean into one side, like if you make the chain ironclad 
and start getting careless in your personal life and your devices and other things like that. Then they're going to come around that side and you have to take care of that side. And then who knows what the technology goes the other way. So it's, it's just a, it's privacy is a, a goal, you know, and to achieve near perfect, first off in the modern, you can leave achieve perfect privacy if you live in the woods, but if you live in modern society, it's very, it's a lot of work and it's constant work to get something approximating privacy. Yeah, no, I don't think uh, Monero is necessarily trying to solve that mm -hmm. problem. You know, it's, it's trying to solve the digital cash problem, right? So it's just like yeah. cash itself, right? Cash is mm -hmm. as private as it can be. But when you show up with a suitcase of cash mm -hmm. somewhere and you're uh, on a camera, sure, it's the same concept. So, but uh, get, getting the, the cash part correct mm -hmm. is difficult, you know? And I think, uh, I think Monero has really focused on that. And I think mm -hmm. the privacy nature privacy by default is fundamental mm -hmm. to that the decentralized nature of it really just censorship resistant unconfiscatable yeah. uh unstoppable decentralization is, is a means to doing that um mm -hmm. and i think monero is really focused on those things dash i haven't yeah. really followed much with that regards i know it where it functions well for sending transactions but mm -hmm. i you know i i mean I think it's lagged, right? I mean, its ability to uh, protect itself uh, in terms of being unstoppable, censorship resistant. It's, I think it recently kind of even admitted it gave up, right, on even being the, the privacy yeah. coin that it was trying to be at one point. So well, it's, uh, that... it's a different, different path, I guess. But fun yeah. I think those things are fundamental to what is going to survive at the end of the day. Yeah, and so that's been a that was a divergence. I think in twenty fifteen was a divergence away from being just focused on this one thing, and being focused on being like the first DAO, for example, and decentralized governance and things like that. Yeah, that was very cool. And, when that and then yeah, and then just getting honing in the payments use case and all this kind of stuff, and it's just that like this is one of those things where like having you know worked in the media the crypto media it's there's almost no one in crypto knows almost anything <laughs> which is why i'm so focused on like using things as a way of learning how they work uh it's been i mean people still say like oh privacy focused whatever people say i've been saying that for over a half decade despite being corrected and say well no digital payments focused and just haven't gotten caught up to that. And then that's the thing about like the, the regulation side of things is from what I've heard, cause I haven't been in any talks with regulators, but from what I've heard, uh, it's 90% like an, a miseducation issue where people just say, Oh, someone put it, whenever I Google privacy coins, it says these scary names. And then those are, we don't want to work with those. And it just like, I mean, there's a few exchanges that like, uh, I believe it was uh, Bittrex that relisted Dash after delisting, after they just got like, edge, oh, my reels, it works just like Bitcoin in a lot of ways. And so um, I think that that's like, literally, I think that there's very little legitimate reason why Monero has been delisted from exchanges. I think it's, there's a little bit of it, which is like, you know, governments and you know, chain analysis companies and powers that be don't like it. I think a lot of it is just that understand they see they just see it on the list and just think, oh, this is dark drug money. And if you're just like, well, no, you can buy anything from it. And it's like, in fact, if you just, you know, it, there's ways of proving a transaction in case you want to say, where did this actually come from immediately prior? There's like a way of showing that. It's like, oh, okay, that's fine. Or like, you know, there's ways of voluntarily doing that if you need to just that kind of thing would make the, you know, the whole thing better. So that's kind of where that divergence thing went on. Uh, it's like the, the lack, like there's just so much being built all the time. And there's been a giant time sink and resource sink in the dash world, which has been building this platform that was formerly codenamed evolution to basically make things easier to use by having blockchain usernames and contact lists and all this kind of cool stuff. And, that has taken like a massive amount of like development uh, focus. And there have been consistent improvements to the CoinJoin functionality. 
to where, you know, it's, I, I would call it a top of the line coin join, but you know, if you're looking for something more like it's trickier when you have a transparent chain, it's trickier to, you know, hide everything along every step. It's just, it's relatively trivial to hide where did I send this or where did this come from in like that. But as far as like the rest of the stuff, like, Oh, you got a bunch, like, we know this is your address. You got a bunch of money. Okay. Or if you have, let's just say um, you rob an exchange or something and make off with a big chunk of money and then that all gets mixed they don't see where it goes but then the same <laughs> size of the chunk shows up in an exchange in the jurisdiction of where they might have traced the ip address of this thing even if they can't connect the dots like even if they can't connect the transaction graph itself they can connect the dots and kind of figure that thing out and of course it's harder to see with with monero for example you'd have to see that on just the exchange itself you wouldn't be able to see on the blockchain a bunch of money went here you just have to be have be tracking every exchange and just say okay this much disappeared from this one this much disappeared on their centralized books but the blockchain element is just opaque in that case so yeah i do i there is a strong agitation in dash community to continue to improve on this kind of functionality and it just the the idea of which direction to go to specifically and that isn't quite out there it's kind of like you know next down the thing and that's the ultimate um i would say you know that's the ultimate condition of the crypto world right now is there's so many different projects doing so many different things and very few of them are doing everything right right now it's almost like you have to pick and choose between some of them like for example oh you want DeFi and stuff obviously you have to go to some sort of smart contract chain and then you know you want some kind of decentralized governance and like that kind of thing and it was like oh cool it was dash and then it was decred and then now a bunch of uh, projects have something similar but it was like you had the governance coin and you had this and then oh you want privacy and then there were just a small group of projects doing that and i think that in this experimental stage we're going to see that and i do think in the next five to ten years we're starting going to start to see more complete projects that do everything. It's like, and like to your point about like, you know, privacy being fundamental. I think that I don't think that there will be that many privacy coins in the future, so to speak, as far as money is concerned, at least I think everything will have to be, or no one's going to use it at some point, you know? Yeah. But I think uh, it's going to be hard for them to achieve that um, mm -hmm. if, unless they're purely focusing on it. Yeah. What do you think? Um, well, this will be the last question just because uh, I'm used to doing a one hour show here with everybody that's yeah. watching. What do you think of Ethereum if it were to, let's say, uh, you know, leapfrog Bitcoin in terms of market cap uh, or pass it? Uh, what effect do you think that would have on the market and people's perception of things, in particular, Bitcoin as being digital gold? What's, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I really don't know. It depends on how it happens, but I do think that's inevitable. I don't think it's inevitable that Ethereum is the one that does it. Although I think it's a strong possibility, but it's certainly the closest at this point. It's right. Yeah. So. I just, so I don't foresee anything catastrophically bad. That's for sure. I just, it just clearly the space is moving forward. Bitcoin is kind of, I, I have a feeling that Bitcoin's peak is going to hit. I mean, obviously it might have hit before, but as in like this last day in the, the headlines, so to speak, is when everyone kind of has some. Because right now when you're like, oh, this country adopt Bitcoin, that country, adopt whatever. Once there's no more of that to happen, then you know, people start moving into what they really want, which is, you know, DeFi, NFTs or what, what the, I mean, that's what they want today, right? but they'll start moving into other things. So I, I think that the entire space, I I hesitate to say too many things that sound negative about Bitcoin because I wouldn't be here without Bitcoin and it still works phenomenally well for a lot of things. And there's still a lot of stuff that the newer projects do that don't do that Bitcoin does well. And that being said, I think that a lot of people poured everything into bitcoin as the biggest brand name being like 
let's push Bitcoin ahead so the whole space gets to follow. And when it just didn't work for payments as well, I just think that that, that took a lot of steam out of all of crypto for a little while as, as far as its adoption. I think it held back mainstream adoption of crypto. And I think we're at the point where that's not going to be the case anymore, right? But like, for example, you have an entire country like El Salvador gets on board with, you know, gets basically mandated by law that everyone has to accept Bitcoin in, for payments. And then you have just these crazy experiences. A lot of that's because you can't really reliably use Bitcoin as a low fee unless you use the Lightning Network, which is, I mean, I used, ran a node for quite a few months and I used it just this week and way better it used to be. But man, let me tell you, it's it's already harder than like Bitcoin used to be. And yeah, what they're basically just, using down there is just a custodial uh, yeah. app where. Yeah, okay. and that's that's even worse. But like, I feel like if people got to use real crypto that works really well, like they wouldn't, I feel like so many people have like brushed into it and then have gone bounced back. So I think it's a great thing if it doesn't have to be Bitcoin first anymore. Now, Ethereum though, it's got to get its fee situation under control. Even it doesn't have to even be cheap. It just, can I send some for like three bucks? Like, can we get it down to that amount? Like, and does or we have to have three hundred dollar Uniswap transactions? I mean, get out of here. And so, if the if the flagship currency or the flagship project does that, that's a problem for new new people. And then on the other side, if you have something like Solana or something that takes the number one spot, then you have something that maybe I maybe it won't be by then, but you know, I think you need a good foundation where that could be trivial for government to not just shut down, because I don't think they would do that, but to censor, to put rules on that. And then all of a sudden you have people, oh, this is crypto. It's great. Oh, well, what do you mean I can't do an NFT of this? What do you mean I can't? And then all of a sudden you have to like relearn, oh, well, that wasn't actually crypto. This is like, this is the stuff that works. And, you know, it's going to be an interesting process. I see it as a good thing if ethereum takes the number one spot over bitcoin over the way it is now but it's yeah, I, th I, I think that think would Bradley definitely would have to hurt bitcoin's narrative in a pretty major way i i don't know what yeah. what their what the response is going to be i mean but it like the the whole store of value and digital gold thing really starts to fade away mm -hmm. right i mean yeah what what is the so, argument what is the argument the I, bitcoiners argument as to why they I wouldn't think care? I do think it'll be around for a while, regardless of if it's the number one. Uh, and I didn't used to think this. I really thought it was going to just collapse, actually. But then the more I sort of learned, uh, there's it's definitely going to become more of a boomer coin, so to speak, where there is something to be said for the never hard forks kind of thing. Meaning if you're some old, you know, if you're some like, esteemed financial institution and you're storing people's bitcoin you never have to worry that stuff's going to break you have to call your it department to fix things otherwise you can't move the funds or something you have a split or something it's just like say it's like gold right you just leave it in the safe it's going to be fine there's value to that which i didn't understand because i'm not in the financial world i'm not in that kind of thing um and then there's also value to the whole mother code base thing like, I think as long as a lot of cryptocurrencies backport to Bitcoin, I think that that's, it's going to have a big, a big thing. And like, there's some ones that are like, for example, Dash is getting closer and closer to like not being able to backport anymore. And just because of you know, the, the code base are diverging more and more, but there's like, a, like Dogecoin relies on it. Of course. I mean, that, that only matters today, but still today. Litecoin back backports. I think Zcash must backport, right? I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's a Bitcoin based currency. It is Bitcoin so, based, my understanding. And so there's just so many of these, you know, like for example, imagine there was like how many crypto note coins are there today that are like that anyone cares about? There's a lot that anybody cares about. Just, I mean, nothing significant other than Monero. Yeah. So imagine there was a few. Imagine some, there were a few, maybe more in like the DeFi or DAO space or something like that, whatever they're, they're basically, they're on the same code base. 
and let's just say they take over instead of Monero for whatever reason, you still, as long as they're backporting, right, then there's still value in Monero because it's like, that's what gets fixed first. That's what has the stronger, more reliable code base because, you know, whatever downstream, you know, gets affected, you'd have to have a complete break and no more backports for that value to go away. And so like, I don't know, there's, and then there's always get, going to be some freaking hipster out there who's like i want to use the old school bitcoin and i you know like there's always going to be some of that so <laughs> we're relying on the hipsters to carry bitcoin's value in the future that's funny it's, kind of, it's getting towards that point now be a collector's you know, right? item it'll be a collector's item it'll be the you know the the nft that it, that it yeah, always absolutely. has yeah the right, limited man. release 21 million unit limited yeah. run nft drop each, each one is unique each one is unique. <laughs> yeah Joel, man, thank you so much for coming on. Mm -hmm. I feel like we could talk for hours and I would love to do this again at some point. Um, mm -hmm. we could, you know, if you're willing, we could do this again in the future. Any interest yeah. in potentially coming down to uh, Monerotopia in Miami? Are you going down to the Bitcoin conference? What day is that? The answer is probably no, but what, what date is that? April 7th. So Bitcoin conference, mm -hmm. like right the first, I think it was the whale day of Bitcoin conference. So it's their first day. We're doing it on the same day. Yeah. Well, I mean, the it's far enough out that there's a possibility. Now, I thought for a second it would have been like December, January. I'm like, no way, not that soon. But there's definitely a possibility. I would. It's oh, let April, us early, early April is the end of the worst, the most annoying seasons in New Hampshire. So it'd be a good time to get to sunnier spots. Just because of like allergies or something, springtime or? No, it's just like winter doesn't really kick in until the end of December and you have like a good December, January, early February of like the yeah. nice snow winter. But then it's like it's tough March and then half of April is like mud season where it's all starting to melt and it's all gross and ugly. And then it's not until like pretty much end of April, early May, you get spring. Yeah. So it's like the, the ugliest part of the year. It'd be nice to leave. Well, if I don't see you down there, I'll definitely see you at Pork Fest. Um, I'm assuming you're you're gonna go, and uh, we had such a great time last year. Definitely going. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'll definitely see you there for sure. All right, man. Anything else you want to throw out that you want to uh, let people know where they can find you, follow you? Yeah. So at the Desert Links on Twitter, that's my Twitter account, um, and then I run a show called Digital Cash Network which is under all the same name, you know, on all audio podcast stuff on YouTube, on Odyssey, the library platform, of course, TikTok, Instagram, everywhere else. And yeah, I do a whole bunch of um, shows and interviews and stuff about all kinds of different crypto stuff. Um, I interviewed um, Francisco Cabanas last oh, year. That was a good one. Awesome. Nice. So that if you want to look for that, and it was one of my more popular ones too. So if you want to look, look, back down through that stuff you can see that one he's a good, cool. good guy to chat with oh yeah i've had him on a bunch of times and he'll be speaking mm -hmm. at the monero conference he'll be one is of he speaking day. yeah 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 we'll have him he'll that's be cool there. yeah we have uh some other devs uh vt mm -hmm. nerd i don't know if you're familiar with him uh maybe and then there's we're working on a bunch of others some of the the big names mm -hmm. in monero development but oh, uh cool. yeah you should have you should try to get like uh, Howard Chu on your show. That'd be cool. He's the yeah, you familiar with Ra Random X. Yes, that's yeah. I'm uh, familiar. I know who Howard is as well. I haven't really chatted with him, but I kind of know who he is. Okay, yeah, he'd be a good guy yeah. to come on talk about Random X. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Thank you so much. No, uh, thank you. It's been yeah, a pleasure. Ciao, yeah. buddy. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.